one or two more minutes before we kick off, do you think? Yes, I, I think it's a good idea. I mean, we want to be back on time as much as we can, but, you know, let's not be too harsh with people. Καλησπέρα και χιλιά. Καλησπέρα. Καλησπέρα, Χιλέα. Καλησπέρα, καλησπέρα. Professor Χαλδεάκης is the Dean of the School of Philosophy at the National Capital District University of Athens. Hello, we look forward to your greetings. Hello, hello, greetings to everyone. Ah, Kevin is online. Fantastic. So glad you were able to join, Kevin. Hello there. Two minutes past. Shall I kick off? Yes, of course, yes. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the conference, the reception of Plato in late antiquity to the middle, from the late antiquity to the middle ages. I'm Ivan Ivanos Lautiris, the person who has bombarded you with emails in the past year. And my co-organizers are Professor George Stiris and Professor George Arabazis. And although the thought of uh, too many Greeks spoil the broth did cross our mind i'm deeply grateful to both of them for their extraordinary professionalism and generous collaboration which goes well beyond this conference indicatively i want to mention that professor Sirius and myself have secured last year a greek diaspora fellowship funded by the institute of international education and supported by stavros nyarvos foundation and the fulbright foundation we are of course deeply grateful to the National Anthropodistrian University of Athens and the Department of Philosophy for their support, including their technical support, the Australian Research Council, which has funded a four-year uh, fellowship. Not fellowship. Not. For myself, sorry. For myself, which means they gave a classicist enough time to work on Plato and Macquarie University, my home institution. Undoubtedly, the conference is ambitious in its chronological scope, but then again, we really want this event to be an opportunity for scholars working on Plato in different periods and different latitudes to get together and start talking to one another. As we all know, new ideas hardly ever come from a vacuum, and often it is a different perspective that leads to new insights. In our approach, we have been greatly encouraged by your phenomenal response to what was originally envisaged as a one-day conference. Only today, we will travel with you from Australia to California, Philadelphia, Montreal, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Norway, Poland, Germany, and Moscow in Russia. And while I do want to say how much we regret that this conference is not taking place at Athens, so we can all have a glass of ooze afterwards, there is something to be said about sharing your work from the comfort of your lounge, along, of course, with your pets and your interior design taste. While we allow you to settle with a new WebEx platform that many of you have not used yet, George Steris will share with us three speeches. One from the Dean of the School of Philosophy at the National Capodistrian uh, University, Professor Hans Akis, that we just met a few minutes ago, live for which we're most grateful and two speeches uh, on video from our heads of department shortly after i will present your keynote speaker professor dirk baldsley and we will be able to stick to the schedule if you're wondering about that because there is this 20 minute break between the keynote speech and the start of the sessions so that's enough from me 
off to George and the uh, greetings. Thank you, George. Uh, welcome. I would like to welcome you all to our virtual conference. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce you Professor Sandeakis, who is the Dean of the School of Philosophy of the National Congress of University of Athens, for a short welcoming address. Professor Sandeakis. George, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, in my capacity as the Dean of the School of Philosophy of the National Capitalistic University of Athens, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for accepting to participate in this conference. An international conference about the reception of Plato from late antiquity, the Middle Ages. Conference organized by the Department of Philosophy of our school, the School of Philosophy of the National and the University of Athens, as well as Macquarie University. Platonic Academy and its ears are a seminal part of the rich philosophical tradition of the city of Athens. The National and Capodistrian University of Athens serves as the keeper and the continuator of Platonic tradition. In an era where classical studies are severely questioned, the School of Philosophy of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens resists by supporting and safeguarding by all means the past Greek philosophical tradition. I would like to congratulate the organizers for bringing exceptional Platonists to participate in this conference. I hope that you will enjoy the conference. I also wish that our cooperation will be fruitful in the years to come. I wish a great success at this conference. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Professor Kamreakis. And uh, the next welcome uh, address uh, is from uh, Professor Vanna Nikolaevu, uh, who is the head of uh, the Department of Philosophy at the National Capitalist University of Athens. Let me share the, the address. Dear colleagues, the Department of Philosophy and I personally welcome you to this important, thanks to your participation, international conference. Congratulations also to the three organizers of this scientific meeting. For the historians of history and the scholars of philosophy, the reception of Plato from late antiquity to the Middle Ages is not an obsolete issue. Rather, it is the link that connects the fundamental ontological and epistemological questions formulated by Platonic philosophy with the conceptualizations on which modern philosophy has been based. Just think, for example, of the contribution of Calcidius' translation of the Timaeus to the formation of the concept of subject rights. In addition, you need just to read the program of this conference the variety of interpretative approaches and the interest each of them presents to understand for the importance of this subject area. Thank you in advance for the wealth of ideas and the new knowledge that your papers will offer us. I wish you fertile and creative work. And we have also a third uh, welcome address from uh, the Dean of uh, Macquarie University. Uh, let me just...
Give me a second to update to share. <clears throat> Para que no me quise el micrófono, el micrófono es eso. Ok, we are ready now. Yeah, and I'd like to welcome you to the conference, the reception of Plato from late antiquity to the Middle Ages. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which Macquarie University is situated, the Wallamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream times. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future, and I extend that respect to the elders of the other nations in Australia on which participants are sitting during this conference and in particular to any Indigenous guests present. On behalf of myself as Head of Department of History and Archaeology, and on behalf of Professor Martina Merlin, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts, who sends her apologies from leave, <coughs> allow me to welcome you to this magnificent conference held as is customary these days across multiple continents and multiple time zones. We're exceptionally pleased to be associated in this endeavour, via this collaboration with the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. And we want to thank the conference organisers from that university for all their work, as well as the leadership of the department and the faculty there for facilitating this conference. At our end, of course, we have to thank our own Eva and Ignostu Lautidis for her role in putting together this conference as part of her Australian Research Council Future Fellowship, which is now drawing to an end with a long string of events and publications over the preceding years. Eva has been amazingly productive during this fellowship, not only in terms of her many publications, but in terms of all the capacity building that these collaborative events, um, collaborative events such as this, have engendered, and we're very grateful to her work for building all these links, which we're sure will have a lot of great results now and in the future. As an historian of late antiquity myself, although one focused for the most part on Egypt, I'm very pleased to see the theme of this conference, and only sorry that between having two young children at home and head of department duties at work, I don't have time to listen to any of the papers live. Eva, George and George have put together an amazing program which showcases from many angles the critical importance to our knowledge of ancient philosophy in general and the works of Plato in particular, of understanding its reception, study, commentary and interpretation in the late antique and early medieval world. As a university with a proud tradition of the study of late antiquity, and the early medieval world, and of the interaction between classical and Christian worldviews, which took place in Europe at this time, it's a particular pleasure to be collaborating in hosting this conference, which I'm sure will produce many insights into how we should understand Plato's interpreters, and the lessons we can draw from their interpretation of his work. So I wish you the best of luck with this conference and the many fruitful discussions you will have. May there be no technical gremlins, and may you all keep awake as your respective time zones drift later in the course of the days to come. I look forward very much to hearing a report of what I know will be a fantastic occasion. I welcome you all again to this fantastic conference. So we're now ready to proceed. Okay. Thank you all for your patience. It gives me great pleasure to present you our first keynote speaker, Professor Dirk Bagley from the University of Tasmania. 
an eminent researcher on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities, Professor Baldsley, my former colleague at Monash, is known to have said, and I hope he hasn't forgotten, be careful which Australian Research Council grant you get. This, I believe, referred to the grant that dealt with Proclus's commentary on Plato's Timaeus. <laughs> Nevertheless, over the years, Dirk has been undeterred from Proclus, and indeed, I'm told that the second volume, I mean, on top of the uh, 20, uh, 2007 and 2009 volumes that came out with Cambridge University Press, I'm told that um, the second volume of the Republic commentary with John Finnamore and Graham Miles is now in press. A bit later in the year, Michael Sher and Dirk will send the second volume uh, of Hermias, which covers the Pali Note, to Bloomsbury Press. And after that, it's onwards without any sense of tiredness to the myth of air. Today, however, Dirk will kick off the conference with a speech on philosophy in the service of empire. So please join me in welcoming Dirk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva and, and the Georges for the kind invitation to, to give a talk this evening. Uh, I'm not sure that the invitation to kick off with the first keynote is exactly the best way to start, but here we are. Um, the paper that I have offered for you to read this evening has a sort of um, light note to it. Uh, so we'll start off in a sort of amusing, provocative fashion and get on to serious philosophy later. I was occasioned to write this. Um, for the magazine of the um, whoops does that give you uh, um, okay if, if you want uh, the PowerPoint I will upload uh, I will share it that would be lovely, thank you, because I'm not very good at this, I'm afraid. I'm a, a Zoom person, and this is unfamiliar to me. Right, there we are. So if you would give us the second slide, George. Thank you. So you may have noticed... Uh, in your corner of the planet, that disciplines like philosophy and classics and history are doing it fairly hard in the early 21st century university. Um, we are thought to be not particularly relevant and not preparing Australians and young people of other nationalities for professional lives, uh, to be good workers. Accordingly, the Australian federal government has just increased student fees for studying subjects like philosophy and classics and history by 113% this year on the grounds that we need more job ready graduates, uh, which allegedly philosophers are not, uh, but engineers and scientists are. And this led me to reflect on the delicious irony of the fact that for a great deal of its history, the Byzantine Empire um, ran on a workforce that included a great many uh, people who had learnt the same texts as our classics graduates uh, and who imbibed Platonic philosophy. And so I wrote a light piece for the uh, magazine of the Academy of Humanities on this very theme, and it seemed like a sort of playful place to start our conference. Um, can we have the next slide, George? Thank you. So I hope that some of you will have had the opportunity to read the paper. It's about 4,500 words long. I want to talk about it briefly and very briefly because I would sooner talk with you than talk at you. So if you've uh, dipped into the paper, you will see that it has the following structure. There's a section on late antique paideia in general, in which I introduce the 
the casual reader to the notion of the elite education shared by um, learned folk in late antiquity and describe a little bit about the journey through the grammarian to the rhetorician and possibly onward to study with a philosopher. Now this form of elite education uh, functioned in the late Roman Empire as a sort of political lubricant. And here I'm, I'm reliant on Brown's power and persuasion book and the sorts of things that he has to say about the way in which the elite education helped sort of get things done. Uh, provincial governors don't actually have a whole lot of pull. There's 147, some of them. Uh, they're not in office for very long and they don't have sort of overwhelming coercive force. So how did they in fact get things done? And one of the ways in which things got done was by entering into a sort of um, relations of patronage in the exchange of favors, which was often sort of facilitated by the public performance of the character of the educated man. Going further with Brown's uh, Power and Persuasion book, I note in the paper that Paide also functioned sort of as an insurance policy. Um, while the power of provincial governors was not absolute, it was very, very considerable. And of course, imperial power is largely unconstrained by law. Um, but it was thought not to be the done thing, for example, that one educated man should have another flogged. It's poor form, like using bad grammar. And so, as Brown points out, Paideia functioned sometimes as a kind of insurance policy. Uh, it defined a class of gentlemen, and there were ways that you just did not treat a gentleman. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, Paideia and philosophy have a sort of intimate connection. Anyone who studied at a school of rhetoric would, of course, have been very well acquainted with the works of Plato and doubtless have composed exercises in the style of Plato, read these texts at, at least as examples of outstanding Greek, if not uh, deeply as philosophers. So what separates a Platonist philosopher in late antiquity from someone who simply read some Plato? And it's the fact that uh, philosophy constitutes a kind of social identity. Uh, you can tell in many cases a philosopher by the way he or she dresses. And consistent with this sort of social identity, there are social expectations and uh, a sort of sort of sort of social license. On the license side of things, there is, of course, the, the ability to speak frankly, to speak truth to power, which is not, of course, always a safe course of action, um, especially then and not even now. The quid pro quo for parisia, of course, was that uh, someone who occupied the social identity of a philosopher was expected to, in some sense, step out of the, um, the usual economy of favors and preferment and advancement, uh, to step back from the rewards of this world to occupy a different plane. Now I want to spend a little bit more time thinking about philosophy and paideia at work in the lives of three people who worked at various levels of the, the Roman state, or at least around the Roman state in the fifth and sixth centuries. And these would be Themistius, John Lydus, and some sort of uh, qualifying remarks at the end about Pamprepius. And I will conclude with um, some speculative parallels about philosophy now and philosophy then. Could we have the next slide, please, George? Thank you. So, Themistius. 
Themistius is valuable to the six emperors that he serves, principally, I think, because of the distinctive role of the philosophical identity. This emerges in his initial encounter with Constantius, in which he gives an encomium and praise of Constantius, in which he uh, assures the audience that they can uh, count on him to tell the real truth, because that's what philosophers do. They tell the unvarnished truth. And he sees fit to praise Constantius for his character um, and virtues that he connects with the political thought of Plato and to a lesser extent, Aristotle. This, of course, provides Constantius with um, a certain sort of opportunity right, to have himself cast in a certain light. And they get on well. To the extent that we can discern from the orations and some of the letters, the Mystius' own political philosophy, it seems to be um, in conversation with frequently uh, Plato's Republic. He seems to think that it's not requisite that there should be philosopher rulers, but rather that there should be philosophical rulers. That is to say, rulers who are civic analogs of divine beneficence, who are advised by philosophers. And the ruler is in this sense uh, superior to the character of the philosopher being a kind of uh, living law. In the various emperors that he served, he plays the role certainly of publicist and very probably of advisor. But he mobilizes both his skills as uh, a public speaker, together with a kind of philosophical gravitas that attaches to the social role. People often point out um, that Themistius's orations seem a bit um, free with the truth here and there, or at least inconsistent with one another. And he sometimes thought of as um, a survivor who blows with the wind in order to uh, make the transition to the next imperial government. But in point of fact, none of the emperors that he serves has an entirely uh, easy and seamless transition to power. And if he indeed does hold something like the philosophical, the political philosophy that I just sketched, um, he may well have thought that he did the very best thing that he could uh, for the empire in legitimating each transition of power as it occurs. Could we have the next slide on John Lydus, please? Thank you. Well, uh, if Themistius is closely advising the emperor, Lydus is hard at work in the, the engine room of empire in the Praetorian Prefecture. Um, unlike Themistius, he doesn't assume the sort of public identity of the philosopher. He's not getting around in the tribune, the sort of philosopher's cloak. Um, nor do we have any sort of very direct sort of evidence of his views on philosophy. But he, nonetheless, we know that he studies with Agapius, who is himself a, a student of Proclus. And if we think about the sort of challenges of John Lydus workplace, and we think about the Neoplatonic philosophy of Proclus, then there are at least perhaps a couple of speculative ways in which his study of philosophy might have fitted him for the work that he in fact did. If you read his book on the offices of the Roman Empire, um, they didn't call it the Byzantine Empire for nothing. Uh, the administrative structure is very, very complex. Um, the prerogatives of various offices are carefully circumscribed. And Lydus has a, a lot of nasty things to say about people who get titles wrong, who don't understand whose duty this is and whose prerogative that is. And so, I think that the 
the sort of mental space cultivated through the understanding of the complex structure of triads sort of fits him for the complex administrative structure that he occupies. And of course, these parallels between the sort of metaphysical structure of intelligible causes and the civic and um, church order, of course, mirrored in uh, that other work uh, that's sort of dependent on Proclus. One of the things that's clear if you, uh, if you read a little bit about Lydus is that there's a kind of tension between uh, looking out for number one in this bureaucratic context and looking out for your, uh, your particular department. And one might suppose that uh, the subtle reconciliation of opposites in Neoplatonism mentally fits a person for trying to reconcile those tensions between securing advancement for oneself and securing uh, the good of one's whole department. Could we pass on to the next slide, please, George? So, what made philosophers and educated people valuable to um, the administration of the, the Roman Empire in late antiquity? Well, philosophers as normally as recipients of Paideia, uh, as friends of the muses, are useful for entering into the kind of economy of favors which pertains among educated people. Philosophers' reputation as fearless truth tellers would have been useful, provided that the truth that they told was one that served their uh, largely unacknowledged patron. And a third theme, which sort of takes us on to the matter of Pamprepius. Um, there's a widespread view in Platonic philosophical, Platonic political philosophy in late antiquity, that there should be a mirroring of the political order and the cosmic order. And this comes back again and again and again in Proclus' commentary on the Republic. And there is also the notion of the interconnection of all things. Um, a Platonic philosopher is someone who should understand that kind of interconnection and be in tune with the cosmos in general. And given that uh, philosophers are particularly pagan philosophers, are supposed to be sort of exceptionally pious in a distinctively philosophical way. That is, of course, one way in which one could be in tune with the cosmos. Of course, another way of doing this is uh, via divination. And this gets uh, a little sketchier. Uh, um, The example of the philosopher Pamprepius, I suppose, provides an illustration of the limits of this notion that a Platonist philosopher would somehow be somewhat attuned to cosmic interconnectedness and thus could advise a powerful emperor. Um, the role of the pagan Pamprepius in a largely Christian court has been uh, investigated by Eva's colleague, Megan McAvoy. Um, and she points out that the sort of the apogee of Pamprepius's influence with the rebellious general Illus seems to have been as a result of his ability in foretelling the future. And of course, that's eventually what uh, catches up with him as the result of a perceived failure of that. Now, in an increasingly Christian empire, there are going to be illicit and illicit means through which a philosopher advisor might be attuned to the sort of underlying natural principles of the cosmos. And Platonism, of course, has an association with astrology that's as old as Thrasyllus, of course, is the, the court astrologer to Tiberius and an editor of our version of Plato's works. And while various Platonists had various views about astrology, I think Porphyry and Proclus, who were uh, well-versed in the theory and practice, 
were probably far more, more typical uh, Platonists than Plotinus was. Um, and so while foretelling the future ultimately caused Pamprepius to come unstuck, the boundaries separating the licit from the illicit means by which a Platonist philosopher might be attuned to the cosmos were porous. Uh, Megan McAvoy notes that the Emperor Zeno made extensive use of horoscopes uh, in spite of his Christian religion. But of course, what a successful emperor and his advisors could get away with is one thing. Uh, what an advisor to a failed usurper like Illus could get away with is probably another. Um, next slide, please. So what should any of this mean to us now? What is this merely quaint history? Well, well, let's try and draw some parallel. When you think about the sorts of skills that philosophy graduates possess, particularly as measured by standardized tests like the uh, law school admission test or the graduate record exam, it looks like they have communication and analytical skills which are uh, pretty far above the standards of many university graduates. Now, of course, that's not rhetoric, but it is communication, and rhetoric was a special form of communication. Now, you might think that more direct forms of communication and analytical skill are what makes someone a friend of the muses now. Equally, one might hope that philosophy graduates still are truth tellers, at least in the sense that they're able to recognize ethical questions and, and, and value presuppositions when they see them. We hope that our graduates then have a willingness to make normative arguments which are expressly normative. But what about that other weird stuff, that attunement to the cosmos and the interconnectedness of all things? Well, it may not have escaped your notice, but some of the sharpest philosophy graduates are people who've done uh, double degrees in subjects like uh, philosophy and mathematics. And absent uh, a booming business in academic careers in philosophy, many of them going wind up working for data analytic firms. And uh, this is probably drawing a very long bow. But one might well wonder whether big data is not something like the astrology of our day. It's, uh, it's a dark art, right? Uh, data mining. Think about the political uh, uses of organizations like Cambridge Analytica and the Brexit vote or the 2016 elections allegedly in the United States. It's embraced in secret frequently hated, not well understood, but perhaps its efficacy is not doubted. In any event, those are some uh, reflections on philosophy graduates then and philosophy graduates now. And finally, George, the last awe slide, please. So that I haven't wasted your time entirely, here's a nice snap of a cute wallaby that I got the other morning. Um, Thank you for your attention. Now, Eva, will you handle finding people who have questions? Because I may or may not see them. I think George uh, will be uh, doing George? that, but I will definitely help him. Yes, yes of course. Someone. So if there are any questions, you can raise your hand or Post your questions through the chat. Ah, I think uh, Michael has a question. Michael Champion, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. I, I wanted to go to the last idea about your modern philosophy graduates and wondered whether there might be some ancient analogues as well for uh, the late antique Platonist. It seems to me that many um, modern philosophers are deliberately not attuned to the cosmos. That is, the sorts of debates that modern philosophers go in for are often so um, arcane or quasi-mathematical or scientistic or 
empiricist that no one could possibly care about any of the questions that they talk about, um, much less think that they have any relationship to reality. I wondered whether um, you thought that was too cruel an assessment of, um, of philosophy, but also whether there's something similar in um, the sort of uh, arcane detail of a Neoplatonic system that has sort of gone to it to be ends of so, so pass the argument out as far as it could possibly go into an area that doesn't quite connect to the rest of the reality around them. Um, and that that might in fact be something quite useful about philosophy. Yeah, nice, nice. I, I, think, uh, I think that people who are interested in, you know, the niceties of modal logic are no less sort of out there than people who were uh, particularly concerned with, you know, how many intelligible triads there are and, and would have been seen as such. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that in late antiquity, that mm, particularity, that, that oddness is perceived of as sort of on a continuum with the peculiar speech of the possessors of ordinary paideia. Right? Um, in the paper, there's a nice pulled quote from Diomedes' Art of Grammar, where he's talking about people who learn rhetoric, all right, sort of paideia up to philosophy. We are recognized to be as much superior to the uneducated who by the formlessness of their rusticity and the disorder of their untrained speech wound and even maim the purity of language guided by strict rule and obscure the brilliance of its elegance, which is the fruit of art, as they themselves <laughs> seem superior to beasts. <laughs> There's something good about being set apart. Right. The problem is that financiers who may be set apart don't inevitably see that an interest in modal logic sets you apart and on the same side of power relations as an interest in sort of algorithms to predict futures markets. But of course, as many of those people make that transition, um, it emerges that in point of fact, that kind of very particular fussy logic chopping um, does have its uses. Right? But I think the public perception is different. Right? It put them on a continuum with the educated elite. But because we don't have anything that plays the same sort of role of, as Paideia does, that looks different now. And maybe it's a good thing, right? Because, I mean, some of the power of Paideia is the, the power of, you know, an Oxbridge classical education in the mid 20th century, right? Um, as valuable for the way it sets you apart from hoi polloi as it is intrinsically. Thank you, Steve. Other question? Eva? Thank you, George. Now, I've already sent you some um, reactions to this paper, uh, Doug, but I, I kept thinking about it. Plato, as we know, did try to interfere and educate the Sicilian tyrants. And regardless of whether we accept that he's the author of episode seven or not, Clearly, he didn't go very far with that. So, why do you think that philosophy being useful to the leaders is a fruitful way for its survival? Hmm. Sorry. Well, maybe it isn't. That's right. I mean, um, 
it, it's a question worth asking because you might well wonder whether the circumstances under which philosophy has been written for, you know, the last hundred and some years, you know, as a department within the research institution, whether that's an inevitable part of universities into the future. Call me pessimistic, but. And so thinking about whether um, a return to something like Hellenistic philosophy, right, where this is much more a sort of marketplace phenomenon than it is uh, a sort of established place within a funded institution. That might be the way in which philosophical writing gets done in the next hundred some years. I mean, who knows what things will look like by 2050, plausibly um, hotter and much less congenial. And one of the things that I think is up for grabs is what the universities of the mid to late 21st centuries will look like and whether they will inevitably include philosophy and classics departments. All right? That the question is a question goes with you know, um, it's definite. What I'm trying know, to you... say is, is there any other way of us reacting to the way things are going? Well, I mean, I think it's not accidental that which parts of the Platonic corpus are regarded as particularly important and salient varies with the sort of material circumstances under which people do philosophy, right? Uh, so when one thinks about the way in which Plato is being read in the Hellenistic period, right, the fight is over who's the Socrates and particularly who's the so Socrates, the aporetic dialogues. And it, it's possible to take seriously the idea that Platonism involves a form of skepticism. And I think that's probably not separable from the circumstances under which philosophy was conducted in the Hellenistic period. Now, by the time we're talking about, right, there are state established chairs in philosophy and rhetoric. And it becomes in some ways, I mean, there is of course vast amounts of private tuition and then there are um, donations to, to the academy from, from wealthy pagans. So it's not part of the state, but it's not divorced from the people who own much of the state. It, it, it's a different thing. And of course, the focus of late antique Platonism is on quite different dialogues, right? It's the Parmenides, it's the Timaeus, it's not, I mean, the Socrates of Neoplatonism is not quite as stoic as the Socrates of Hellenistic philosophy, right? So, you know, Platonism changes according to the circumstances under which Platonists exist. Thank you, that says a lot. Are there any questions? I think we have time for one more before we enter the, the parallel sessions. So, uh, let me take advantage of my privilege as a coordinator of the session to ask a, a last question to, to Dirk. Uh, following uh, Eva's uh, question, I would like to, to, to ask you, do you think that uh, late antique funding to uh, philosophers and schools of philosophy has to do mostly with uh, supporting the state or safeguarding uh, the old tradition, the, the pagan tradition? People who, who funded these schools uh, they aimed at uh, the continuation of pa pagan culture, or they wanted to support 
the new border state. Yep. I I think that's one of the most sort of interesting contests about Platonism in late antiquity. I mean, certainly pagan Platonists think that what they are doing, the broader cultural project, is the preservation of all that is good in Greek from this shallow Koine worshiping Johnny come latelys. At the same time, right, prior to Julian, at least, Plaide is as much a marker of class identity as it is a religious identity. And I think Julian sort of forces people to choose. And it now becomes a question for educated Christians to what extent Paideia in general and Platonism in particular can be given an acceptable face. And I think that there are competing intellectual projects going on there. And then there are some people for whom, you know, the projects don't seem to be that important because Paideia and philosophy is not so much a religious identity as it is a class identity. And I don't, I think it depends on the individuals that you were talking about. Okay. Synesius isn't Julian. <laughs> um, and I think there's a great deal more diversity about the way in which this project is received than we are sometimes want to admit. Thank you very much. So I think that uh, this first session ends now, and uh, we have to, to move to the parallel sessions. Uh, the links uh, are available at the program. And so we will we'll meet again in about eight minutes. George and Eva, mm -hmm. is it, must one commit to one of the streams or can you hear two papers and then jump out and then go to the other stream? I think oh, you can in and out. Yes, yes. In, okay, you can, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you once again.